One curious ecclesiastical phenomenon is when a church splits in a schism and then one side of that schism recognizes a post-schism figure on the other side as a saint. Uh, For example, there are Eastern Rite Catholic churches which recognize certain Orthodox Christians who lived after the Great Schism of the 11th century as saints. And uh, so, too, certain uh, Lutheran and certain Anglican churches have days commemorating Pope John XXIII, whose papacy began more than 400 years after the Reformation and the Church of England's uh, break from Rome. Now, another example of this phenomenon, which I'd like to focus on in this video, is a man who's known in the West as St. Elisban, uh, St. Elisban the Ethiopian. Now, you'll notice in this depiction, he has his foot on a man who is wearing a crown, uh, which will come up in a moment. The, the man who's standing above him, uh, you know, the man who's called St. Elisban uh, the Ethiopian, was a member of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and he lived decades after the split which happened at Chalcedon, or as some pronounce it, Chalcedon, uh, in the mid-5th century. Uh, In the Roman Catholic Church, St. Elisban's feast is today, the 27th of October. Now, in Ethiopia, he was known as Caleb il Atzbeha, and he was actually an emperor based at Aksum. Uh, The depictions of him which have been shown so far, uh, including the one that's currently on your screen, are Western Catholic depictions. And as we scroll down on this depiction, you'll notice that he's once again depicted as standing over a man wearing a crown. You'll also notice that the text at the bottom reads in Portuguese, Santo Elisbao, Imperador da Vicina, uh, which means uh, Saint Elisban, Emperor of Ethiopia. And there's even a a Portuguese church named after uh, Santo Elisbao in Brazil, a Catholic church. But... I want to ask this question. Who is the man with the crown that he's often depicted as standing over? Well, that's Dhunuas, a king who lived in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula in the early 6th century. Uh, Dhunuas converted to Judaism and converted his people, his subjects, to Judaism as well. And uh, Dhunuas then proceeded after his conversion. He took on the name Yusuf, so Yusuf uh, Dhunuas. He uh, proceeded to attack local Arab Christians, you know, Christian populations in the Arabian Peninsula, in the pre-Islamic Arabian Peninsula, uh, because he was uh, seeking vengeance on behalf of Jews who had been mistreated by Christians elsewhere. Now, Dhunuwas's attacks on Christians culminated with the sacking of the then Christian city of Najran, uh, which resulted in many Christians being killed. Uh, the sacking of Najran was so bad that the Romans reached out to the emperor of Ethiopia, who happened to be uh, the aforementioned Atzbeha, uh, who's again known as uh, St. Elisban. The Romans reached out to Atzbeha and uh, asked him to step in. So Atzbeha sent an army led by Abraha to invade the Arabian Peninsula and confront Dhunuas. The armies led by Abraha defeated the armies of uh, Dhunuwas, and they killed Dhunuwas himself and scattered his Jewish subjects, perhaps even selling some of them into slavery, including uh, in parts of Africa. Now, these events on the pre-Islamic Arabian Peninsula were so significant that they wound up getting mentioned in later Islamic literature, including commentaries on the Qur'an. For example, while uh, Surat al-Buruj, which is the 85th chapter of the Qur'an, And uh, Surat al-Fil, which is the 105th chapter of the Quran, uh, while those two chapters are both vague in terms of what precisely they're referring to, some later Muslim commentaries have asserted that al-Buruj was referring to the Christians who were killed at Najran by the forces of Dunuas. And that Al-Fil is referring to God protecting Mecca when Abraha tried to march against it during his occupation of the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. Now, as a disclaimer, I'm not claiming those Quranic commentaries reflect the actual intention of the author or authors of those two uh, Quranic chapters. But I think it shows that, you know, even if they're not accurate in terms of, you know, reflecting what the text actually refers to, it would still show that the reign of the Jewish king Dunuas and the subsequent Ethiopian invasion under Atzbeha 
you know, which defeated the Nuwas, were such significant events in the pre-Islamic Arabian Peninsula that they got imprinted on the Arab psyche and wound up influencing even these later Quranic commentaries. Now, last summer, Orthodox Moore and I briefly discussed this on his show. Uh, there are both written sources and certain oral traditions that treat certain communities in Africa as descending from Jews who lived in Yemen, uh, or you know what's now Yemen, the, the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. Now, some of those communities, like the Lemba, are purported to have left Yemen after a local disaster, like a dam break. But others' communities might descend from Jews who lived under the Nuas and who either fled into Africa after the armies of Atzbehad defeated them, or might even descend from prisoners of war who were sold into slavery. Now, uh, I'll play a little less than five minutes of that discussion on Orthodox Moore's show. Uh, while Atzbeha or uh, El Esban doesn't get mentioned, there is discussion on how some of these migrations of Yemeni Jews into Africa were set into motion by Ethiopian uh, by the Ethiopian conquest of Dhul Nawas's forces, uh, as well as the impact such warfare had on the minds of later Quranic commentaries. So here's the clip. Into West Africa. Mm -hmm. And people like Dan Marnici think that, uh, and myself also, um, we both agree on the concept that uh, that the migration from the, from uh, from Southern Arabia um, and East Africa was was probably a lot larger than the migration from the Levant. Um, however, like there was there was a large Semitic population in East Africa, uh, Southern Arabia, and whatnot. A lot of which I uh, one one migration I talk about a lot is is the migration from uh, from uh, the Hemirite Kingdom over into uh, into Mali. When uh, the Hemiarites fell over, fell to the to the Christians and whatnot, mm. and so this this is something that's this that's documented in uh, the I believe the Tariq El Sudan um, or the El Fatash. I believe it's El Sudan um, in uh, in Mali and whatnot, to where they 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 they, uh, they have people coming over, and then the local tradition along with the written tradition stipulates that they were um, that they were Jews that came over from Yemen and whatnot. They lost, they lost to the Christians and whatnot. And that's in five, like circa five twenty five. Yeah, yeah. Duke Nawaz, uh, Duke Nawaz. Yeah, he was uh, he was he had he had converted a lot of people to Judaism, but obviously there were also Jews that moved into his kingdom. Anytime you get that sort of a situation, and because he was attacking uh, Christian cities, the Ethiopians came in. The Ethiopian Christians crossed, you know, yeah. the, the waters and basically defeated his armies and and possibly killed them. Different sources say different things. One source says he was drowned in the ocean. But whatever the case, then those Jews that were under him got scattered, you know? Some of them, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, some of them, if I recall correctly, some of them even got sold into slavery, you know? Mm -hmm. By Ethiopians, you know? By Ethiopian yep. Christians. And so, what's interesting is at the time, like, so, um, with the Lemba, they say that, like, in their in, in, in their migration pattern, that like, they would have been in Senna, and they also would have migrated from Senna around that time. But, like, so, in talking to Kohen Amadishe and also to Tudor Parfit, um, we were able to put together that there was multiple migrations from Senna. Um, mm. And so one of the migrations was from a drought and one of them was from a dam breaking in a flood. And so I, I, I got to find the source, but I can, I know I read it somewhere that in that, in the time period when the Christians came in and were doing work on the Hemurites, that they, that something that happened was like a big dam broke somewhere and that there was a, a flood that happened somewhere. And so I got to, I got to time that out, but either or, um, I know that there were multiple migrations into Africa from Senna, um, from Tudor Parfit and uh, and uh, and Cohen Hamadisha and whatnot. And so um, Tudor Parfit literally says, like, no, there's certain spots in West Africa you need to go test the DNA because it's, it's going to be like it should be similar to the Lemba. Um, and there's only two ways that they get there: either you get it right, either you're going around the Cape, or you're going straight through. Um, and so it's a it's a shorter ride straight through the Sahel. And again, the Sahel is is, the, is like the super highway of Africa, historically speaking. And so it makes a lot of sense, particularly when you when you have people recorded as already going there. Um, mm. so. If you'll forgive a, a bit of a segue, uh, the uh, was is it Surat Al Buruj? There's one of the chapters of the of the Quran. Um, I mean, it's it's vague, but there's uh, commentators who believe that that's referring to part of uh, Surat Al Buruj is referring to the 85th chapter. I think it is. Uh, some commentators, especially Shia commentators, believe that it's referring to conflict between uh, Duh Nuwas's people and uh, Christians, you know? I never thought about that. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that, that's even alluded to in the... In, yeah, I mean, like, if you're wow. just reading the Quran okay. in a vacuum, you know, it won't necessarily be clear, but there are commentators who say this is referring to that. the plight of Christians under uh, Duh Nuwas, you know? That's super interesting. 
I never even thought about it like that. Well, not only that, if I'm not mistaken, isn't uh, is it Surat Al Fil the the one about the elephants and the the birds, um, you know, launching uh, the stones? Some commentators think that's re referring to Abraha, right? <laughs> and Abraha would have been part of this Christian army that came into Arabia to fight uh, these Jews who were attacking Christians. That's interesting because as a Quranist, I don't get too much in the commentary, but like I never like again that makes a, that makes a lot of sense, particularly when you understand. Um, <sighs> Oh wow! Because yeah, because that that would all be in 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 the mindset of people in, in the beginning of Islam or whatnot. Because yeah, like, yeah, irrespective yeah. of whether wow. their interpretations are accurate, you do have right. commentators who are trying to cor co correct the the Quranic text to events surrounding right. uh, Duf Nuwash, so surrounding these Jews uh, that were Makes that sense. had a kingdom in southern Arabia in what's now Yemen, and whose kingdom got destroyed by uh, right. Ethiopian Christians. You know, Back. oh, that makes so much sense. I, I've I've never looked at it from that perspective. I got to do that now. Mm. Wow, appreciate you on that one. But, uh... Okay, as that clip included discussion on how certain Quranic commentators, commentators, including Shi'i uh, commentators, interpreted Surat al-Buruj, I want to close out this video with a nine-minute clip of the Shi'i scholar uh, Omar uh, al-Naqshawani discussing precisely that subject. Now, while the details of the commentaries he leans on employ somewhat fantastic legends, so you know you're free to be skeptical. Uh, and take it with a grain of salt. I nonetheless figures that that others might find this interesting. That others might find it interesting that there are uh, Quranic commentators who said that the 85th chapter of the Quran was referring to the plight of pre-Islamic Christians in the Arabian Peninsula who were being uh, oppressed and killed by a Jewish king, Dhul Nawas. Uh, I also figured that others might find interesting how uh, Al-Naqshawani treats that Jewish king, Dhul Nuwas, as a sort of precursor to the modern terrorist group called ISIS, you know, or Daesh. Uh, so before ending, uh, before ending this video with the clip, I'll just say uh, to, you know, Qidus uh, Kaleb or Sanctus Elebanus, whatever you want to refer to him as, pray for us. And on that note, I look forward to the comments of others. I hope you enjoy this clip. It runs for about nine minutes. God bless. Surah Al-Buruj, Surah 85 of the Holy Quran. When it was revealed, the early Muslims were being tortured and executed by the Quraysh oppressive hierarchy. Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl, Utbah bin Rabi'a, Walid ibn al-Mughira, they were torturing the early Muslims. When the Quran reveals certain verses, sometimes it reveals those verses in order that you have a sense of solace. You have a sense of empathy. You have a sense of feeling that there were people who were oppressed before me. What's interesting about Surah Al-Buruj is that it was revealed telling the early Muslims that there were a group of Christians who came before you. If you think you were oppressed because of your love of God, look at the way the Christians were massacred before you with their love of God. What do we mean? In Yemen, Yemen used to be run by the Jewish community under a man by the name of Yusuf bin the Nuas al Himyari. Jewish leader, there were Christians living in Yemen, there were pagans living in Yemen, but he was the Jewish leader in charge. Someone might turn around and say, why are you talking about Christians? This is the Quran. The Quran is not concerned with your religion. It's concerned with looking at principles and reminding you of those principles. Yusuf bin Dino As al Hamyari, when he came, he was ruling the town, but Judaism could never be questioned, and no one could go out and spread the word of Christ. Jesus, son of Mary's Christianity, no one was allowed to go out and spread it, because you know there's a problem between the Jews and the Christians on the issue of Jesus. Therefore, what happened was there was a young man in that town. That young man changed the course of his people's history, yes? That young man, do you know what he did? That young man was on his way to learn some magic. On his way, he walked past the house. He heard some recital in the house. When he heard this recital in the house, he said, this is the most beautiful recital I've ever heard. Knocked at the door, a monk came out, the monk of Christianity. When he came out, he said to him, excuse me, what are you reading? He said, I'm reading the Psalms from the Bible. What is the Psalms? The Zabur of Dawood, yes? The Psalms is a set of hymns and supplications. He said to him, where does this come from? He said, it comes from Jesus, son of Mary, and from the prophet David, alayhi salam. He said, can you teach me? 
This person got so close to the monk, he became so spiritual, so learned about Christianity, that he would go around telling people about the message of Christ. The Jews had a problem with Christ, until today is the same problem. Therefore, what do you find? Some of them started noticing that this young boy is spreading Christianity. No one really said anything until this young boy would perform miracles. If someone was ill, the young boy would cure them. If, for example, someone needed help, one day there were a group of people trying to cross the river, there was a wild animal. They saw the young boy and said, can you help us? I said, of course I can help you. They said, but no one's ever killed that wild animal. He finished the animal straight away, they were amazed. And therefore you found the king heard that there's a young boy, doesn't know the religion, he just said, they told him there's a young boy, and this young boy can achieve miracles. So the king said to the young boy, come here. When the young man came, he said to him, my daughter's been ill. No one can cure her. Can you? He said to him, yes, I hope I can, with the help of the Almighty. When he was able to cure her, he said to him, how did you cure her? He replied back to him by saying that I cured her because I asked God through the Prophet Jesus alayhi salam. He said, who? He said, Jesus. He said, the man who calls himself the king of the Jews? That man? He said, yes. He said, how dare you? You go around in my town and you think that you can tell people about Christ while I, the Jewish emperor, is in charge? He turned around to me and said, I'm not trying to change people's lives. I'm only trying to advise them on what's helped me in life. If they want to take it, they can take it. They are free. He said, you will be executed if you continue. He said to him, do you think I fear execution? He said, I'll execute you. They took him up to a mountain to execute him. The mountain crumbled. The people left him. Later, the king called him, caught him, said, we're going to execute you and the whole of the Christian community. They gathered the Christians of the land of Yemen. When they gathered them, do you know what they did to them? They got a burning ditch, a ditch, a fire. This was a complete holocaust. Do you know what holocaust means? Holocaust is from the Greek. Holos kostos complete burning yes they bought all the christians and when they bought them they bought this young man and he said to them he said listen have faith in christ we will be okay we will be saved there is nothing to worry about and the quran describes it beautifully someone says but the quran the quran is for muslims not at all the quran says whenever anyone worships allah is oppressed speak out for them even if they don't agree with what you agree with yes Christianity and Islam may have different opinions, but it doesn't mean we don't speak out. Do you know what the Quran said? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wasamai datil, wal yomil, maw'ud. Wasahidin, wa mashhud. Qutila ashabul ukhdud. Listen to what the Quran says. By the sky and the constellations. Someone says, why does it say by the sky and the constellations? Everything you mankind do is below the sky. The sky will speak about what you did under it, yes? By the sky and its constellations. And by the promised day of judgment. And by the witness and the witness. Be on the people of the ditch. You know what, what it meant? These people would get the ditch. And Nari. And they get the fire, they'll fuel the fire. They make sure the fire is really fueled. They would sit there. Imagine all of them sitting there. You know, when you kill someone, I don't know even myself, I'm saying this, but I don't know the feeling. But you know, when someone kills someone, it can't be that easy for you just to sit down and say, let's just sit and enjoy this, correct? You must be barbaric. You must be someone insane. Someone full of hatred. The Quran said, Laan on the people of the ditch, the ones who gathered. Fire, full of fuel. And what did they do? And they used to all sit by the fire. And what was the crime of the people they burnt? What was the crime? Their crime was, the only thing that they were killed for was because they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know what they would do? Get a Christian, throw him in the fire. Get a Christian, throw him in the fire. Get a Christian, throw him in the fire. You see what's happening in Iraq today or no? Yes? Pakistan, correct or no? In Kuwait and Parachinar. Go to other areas. Afghanistan, go to other areas. See what they're doing? They would get them, throw them in the fire. Throw them. Until one lady was with her baby. They came to her and they said to her, 
do you discredit Christ? Do you disbelieve in Christ? She replied, no, I believe. She saw everyone being burnt alive. At that moment, a doubt came. You know what? Maybe I should say that I don't believe and I will be saved. The narrations mentioned her baby spoke to her and said, Mother, do not worry. We are dying on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that moment, even the mother and her baby were thrown in there. They executed the Christian community of Yemen. One of them survived, went to the Roman emperor who told the Najashi of Abyssinia. The Najashi of Abyssinia came back and he got vengeance for that killing. Why did the Quran mention the story? It wasn't Muslims who were killed. So why is the Quran concerned? The Quran wanted to highlight that there are times where the human is so barbaric. They will make ditches with fire and throw humans in there. Yes, they will get rivers and shoot bullets into people's head and throw them in there. They will decapitate hands. They'll decapitate heads. They'll decapitate bodies. So the Quran said, learn from that example. Why? Because the early Muslims, Ammar bin Yasser, his father Yasser, his mother Sumayya, they were tortured and tortured and tortured. And so such surahs were telling them, don't worry if you're being tortured. There are many before you who died oppressed, who were tortured, but because they had faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they died as shuhada in the way of Allah. And that's why you found that when people ask, when was ISIS first mentioned? ISIS was first mentioned by Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.